I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. And you know, it's all about the neighborhood. This is a conversation about how we build our community, our neighborhood, house by house, family by family. We're focusing on business creation, business development, economic development, and culture. I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. Today's program focuses on an issue that's been in the news, the question of conflict between newly arrived Africans, African Americans, and the legacy African American community. You often will read stories that suggest that there is distrust, there is fear, uh, that there is antagonism between uh, black kids, meaning African-American kids, and Somali kids, for example. We want to explore that question and say uh, to ourselves, to our community, that we believe that there is more cooperation and agreement than there is disagreement, and that we want to be intentional and active in promoting the value of high quality living of uh, improving all of our communities by our association. I've asked Reverend Jerry McAfee to co-host today to join me in exploring this question. He's leading some exciting initiatives this summer, bringing our communities together. Reverend McAfee is the pastor of New Salem Missionary Baptist Church in North Minneapolis, and he is the president of the Minnesota State Baptist Convention. Reverend McAfee, good morning, and thank you for being here. Good morning. Thank you for having me. So let's talk about this. When you uh, get information in the community about conflict between, say, black people and Somalis, how does it come, and how do you react? You know, one of the earliest things, uh, Al, was the issue that happened at uh, the high school. And I know one of our point people who have been doing that for a while it was Al Flowers, and he called me into a meeting uh, with some of our Somali brothers about it. But it was over two, three years ago, I think, that we first met over South with the Somali community. One of my concerns when I saw that a lot of the different African brothers and sisters was coming from across the continent here, that there was never any dialogue between the two groups. Most African Americans, our picture of Africa and Africans in my era was perhaps Tarzan, mm -hmm. where we did not see and they did not promote any positive images of Africans. And then we also know that the historicity of this country is to make sure that when Africans come into this country that they get a bad word on African Americans. And so consequently you can see that what took place in Heritage Park that uh, it was brewing, that something was going to eventually break out because if you get two groups of people that don't have a lot of a level of understanding or conversations about each other and you do some of the things that I believe that the system uh, intentionally did, mm -hmm. that there would be conflicts. Well, let's but, back up. So explain yeah. Heritage Park. You brought that up. What, what happened? H Heritage so Park uh, was one of the main project areas over north that was predominantly African Americans. At the time that they uh, tore it down and rebuilt it, it was supposed to have been many of those African American families coming back to Heritage Park. However, we know that today and years ago that did not happen. And what they did do, there's a large contingent of Somali brothers and sisters there. Now, if you take some of those groups of people that were displaced and they don't understand fully that it wasn't the Somalis who created that. They needed the service, they got the service. That was bureaucrats who did that. And so you can create issues. Then the other thing that, you, to me, that you understand, that as far as I'm concerned at South High School, Kids will act a nut with each other. Just because I'm African American and you're Somali, if we into it, it don't necessarily have to do anything with our ethnicity. It has, we kids. Hey, hey, thank you. Right. Somalis fight Somalis, Ethiopians fight Ethiopians, African Americans fight African Americans, but if we fight each other, now we gotta be culture and class war. And that's nonsense. What we're trying to do, is A, on this particular date, we pray that we can break it off by May 25th. It's what I want to call family reunion. 
uh, our African brothers and sisters are much older than us, whether we know it or not. And uh, just our history for some of us started in America. They're back at the continent. How do we get together, meet and greet each other, officially welcome each other to come into these circles and then not be afraid to share our cultures, even our religions? I, I'm not going to try to convert anyone to Christianity, but I can be enough of a Christian to respect my Muslim brothers and sisters mm -hmm. and to uh, issue a welcome mat out to them. So one, then the kids can see that if, if, if some of the, and I don't classify myself as a leader, but if some of the elders can get together, and show how we can, as, as one passage in Isaiah says, come now, brethren, let us reason together. So we can sit down, break bread, and get to know each other. Because one thing for certain, and this is what I've shared with uh, Nigerians, Liberians, Ethiopians, and Somalians. You can say what you want, but in America, if you got this color skin I got, I don't care where you come from, you black. <laughs> Understand that. And so there are lessons that we can help teach them about what they're going to be facing. And then some of them might not really comprehend in totality what racism and white supremacy really look like. Well, we got PhDs in that and never graduated from a college with it. We've lived it. So I think through creating these dialogues that Al was uh, played years ago and helping us do, we continue to grow those things and expand that. And now we look at how we can organize ourselves politically, and otherwise, for the goods of our people. Let me go to Abdirazak Bihi, who is the uh, director of the Somali Education and Social uh, Policy Center. I think that's the right name. <clears throat> um, first of all, I want to thank you. Um, it's not the first time I came here. And um, I want to also mention that you have been on the Confederation of Somali mm -hmm. Community Board for a long time. So I want to thank. Um, the elders and the leaders of the African-American community, um, uh, such as um, Al Flowers, who's here, and uh, Spike Lee. Spike Moss. Uh, Spike Moss, I'm sorry, <laughs> Spike Lee in New York. He's in New York, I've never met him. But I watched this movie, so um, Spike Moss, Zachary, and many others um, that I've worked with. Um, I want to thank the Reverend McAbee. Um, we had the opportunity to be outreach to we had the opportunity to receive a hand from the African-American leadership uh, to help us not to reinvent the wheel, but to um, help us uh, navigate the many challenges uh, in this country. Um, it's not easy to just show up here and um, um, just have a beautiful life. Uh, it's a lot of struggles, and uh, the African-American community had went through this struggle for over 500 years. So. It's our um, blessing, and, and um, it's a blessing to have that uh, extension of hand, um, not to go through the same thing. Um, I had the opportunity to work with these leaders quite some time and um, to learn from each other. We were ignorant of these struggles. When I'm saying we, as a community, had never had the opportunity to learn the history of the, uh, and the struggle uh, of the Afri African American community in this country. But we had the opportunity to enjoy the fruits of those struggles. Mm -hmm. We came here when we enjoy all those uh, fruits. Um, so one of the things we are working together is to have um, um, the opportunity again uh, to learn, um, to have those programs to educate my community, uh, my African community. Um, about these struggles and, and, um, and the aspirations and all those uh, challenges that the African American uh, community went through. So my community would appreciate what they, what they are enjoying. And also to help our African American community to learn about our African struggle, whether it's a colonialism, whether it's um, the miseducation we had about the African American community, because I remember when I lived in Mogadishu, which was the capital city, which is still the capital city of, of Somalia, a huge city of millions of people. Um, in my neighborhood theater, we watched um, all movies. Somalia is a poor country, so can't afford to get the new movies. So we used to watch 50s, 60s movies. And the role we have seen, um, the role that the African-American community plays in those movies were not positive. 
So those of us who had the opportunity to watch movies at, the, at those times in those cities did not get good protection of the African-American community. So there's a lot of miseducation. And um, also, on the other side of the Atlantic, our brothers watched National Geographic, which I still do. And I don't see Mogadishu or Nairobi, but I see safaris, lions, which is good because I've never seen a lion. <laughs> it's good for me to see all those animals. Uh, it saves me a trip to the zoo. But, um, but I don't see Africa. I have known. I don't see the beautiful beaches and cities and the communities I grew up. I don't see the beautiful communities in Nairobi, Mombasa, uh, Tanzania, uh, Zimbabwe, South Africa. Yes, yeah, South Africa, I see that. Um, so, so there's a lot of uh, work that's cut out for us to do, and um, we are going to start to, uh, to materialize that work by attending the invitation uh, extended to us to bring the families and the community together by the, um, um, uh, the New Salem Baptist Church leadership, such as Reverend McBee, and of course, Al Flowers. So it's, it's, a, it's a new dawn for us. Um, it's all about miseducation. I, I said this with Al in the news when the South High issue happened. It, it was misquoted as a racial tension, which I, I obviously not. But how do it, you have it, racial tension? Yes, which I'm obviously, right, yeah. <laughs> obviously not. Um, but you know, if two neighbors don't know each other, I live in the high rise of Cedar Riverside. So if you don't know your neighbor, you could have all kind of conflicts because you could also form your own perception of who that neighbor is, mm -hmm. because you don't know that person. So you can just make up your mind and create a personality of that person. So that's what's, what was happening with these kids. Of course, as many leaders, including uh, Mr. Moss, Spike Moss said, not only Somali community needs to, Somali young kids need to learn ab about the African American history, but the African American young people also do not know their history. So we have, we've got a lot of work to go. Dr. Ababa, you're an educator, and you are working with uh, the products of public schools, but you also have uh, generations of experience here as a, a citizen and resident of this country. You've observed this dialogue over a generation or two, and when you hear this conversation, what comes to mind? Uh, what can you tell us about uh, the ebb and flow of what's perceived to be conflict or what ought to be perceived as opportunity for engagement? Well, you know, the, the, uh, historically, uh, most of us Africans have been settled in African-American communities or in communities of color, if you will. Um, as a consequence of that, the conflict is bound to happen or the challenges that communities face is bound to happen. But the truth of the matter is that at the end of the day, most of us found safe haven within the African-American community. In my own experience, uh, and I think you know we've known each other for quite some time, and I have I have found constant positive and and very encouraging uh, personal relationships within the African American community. Some of my mentors, uh, Professor Mark Mudalkati, and others I have known for over 30 years. And I think when when the African community recognizes that had it not for the blood and sweat and tears of the African Americans we wouldn't be here. And I think the truth is we owe it to the community to begin to really think and learn about our neighbors. And I think you rightfully said, which is very, very important, is that neighbors will have some challenges. I mean, the Irish face the same thing. The Jews face the same thing. The Southern Italians who came to America face the same thing. But at the end of the day, they found sanctuary in communities that look like them. And I do know we as Africans are going to have to end up recognizing that. And, and so in a sense, uh, these challenges are temporary. These challenges are manufactured. Because most of us, you know, if there is such thing called assimilation, uh, a lot of Africans actually get to assimilate into the African-American community. Again, if there is such a thing called assimilation, even though the dominant culture would like to believe that the assimilation can take a different phase and a different pattern. But the truth is, uh, we started to enjoy the music, the culture, the food, uh, and perhaps even share the psychological makeup of that community in many ways than one, because we inherently bring that reality to, this, mm -hmm. to the society. So uh, the kids fought, yes. 
but to couch it as a racial tension, I think, is a huge stretch because uh, it, it, the fact of the matter is those challenges are bound to happen because of misconceptions, misunderstanding. And, and also, you know, when you settle in the same neighborhood, uh, scarcity of resources suggests that you get, you're bound to have some, mm -hmm. some fights, some challenges. And uh, uh, the new immigrants are opening up stores, they're opening up new businesses. You know, people see that, and if they are not employing one of us, you know, that raises a question. We need to learn as immigrants to broadly think about our own success in those communities it depends on how well we embrace our brothers and sisters who's in the communities in which we live in. In this case, I think for the most part, African Americans. So I, I do see, I mean, history tells us, studies after studies have told us that it is not, I mean, it's a matter of time for us new immigrants to begin to understand who really are our neighbors and what sort of challenges that we need to face together as opposed to separately. And so, um, so I have a feeling that uh, these, these, I mean, I, I think Reverend McAfee and others who are, who are bringing us together is just a natural and logical continuation of what we need to, be, to start doing because I think the, the, the relationships are uh, bound to happen and should happen and beginning actually happening. And in my own life, you know, I have lived here long enough to know <coughs> that most of us, we don't have, in, have questions anymore. <laughs> I mean, we know who would be uh, our kin and mm -hmm. our family, our relationships. And so, um, yes, I do realize that, that these are temporary matters. <laughs>
and it's about providing those opportunities for us to know each other. Our lives are all richer when we reach out and get truly engaged with each other, not just on a superficial way where I'm going to go shop at your store once in a while, but where we really know each other. That's how our lives become richer. That's how our world becomes richer. Our city becomes richer. That's how our communities are built. You know, here's what I think. I think that uh, <clears throat> I have this great appreciation for this business drive mm -hmm. that I see in the Somali community. And it reminds me of the community that I grew up in and grew out of, black people, entrepreneurial. And so Somalis are, in my view, the latest reflection of this character uh, in us. And they have that character uh, front and center. The Somali community is all about, from my point of view, this is kind of an exaggeration, but it's a positive one, I hope, uh, is about business finding ways that we can create services for each other and for the community and for the market in general. And I think that uh, one of the things I predict, I envision, is that that entrepreneurial spirit will actually support and motivate, challenge, uh, and invite, stir the, the uh, uh, intrinsic entrepreneurial spirit in our community, the black community as well. What do you think, Reverend McAfee? You're a businessman, and, and you know that we've got a history of uh, being uh, doers and builders. Well, that, that, that would be extremely awesome. You know, the, f for those of people who don't understand uh, segregation and what we used to do and own before uh, integration, you see that in, in our brothers and sisters from the continent. If we are able to harness, and we will, the power of that dollar collectively, Somalians, Liberians, Nigerians, African Americans, where we are doing business with each other, where we're helping each other, it changes and shifts the whole tide. The opportunities are out of this world because our people need to see because you know there's all black folk they can't work together They're talking about African Americans and uh, as a contractor and this is interesting uh, our company we contract you know what and some of the work that we do is in is in white homes whereas I even got some members of my own congregation who will hire a white contractor now you'll trust me with your spiritual soul but not with your house. <laughs> <laughs> and your house is temporal. But it's just that psyche that's there. And so when we look out and we see the cabs, uh, when I'm going to work out downtown, I see these uh, Ethiopian ladies down there working, doing, because the, you know, the way I came up, you do what you need to do to survive that's positive and right. I picked strawberries, I cut grapes, I picked plums, I picked apples, I picked peaches, the whole nine to survive. And we even see that in our Hispanic brothers and sisters. Now, as we began to learn those lessons again, and now we're communicating with each other, now we might have that first good restaurant in North Minneapolis. Uh, we were over at, in South Minneapolis, and, and, and some of them ain't gonna want me to tell it, but I'm gonna tell it. And man, they had prepared this lavish meal. And again, I'm a country boy. I, I grew up eating goat. So eating goat, it wasn't new to me. And so some of the people that was with us, they saw these ribs and it looked real good to them. And they, some of them put it on their plate. And when they got it, they said, what is this? This goat, they brought it to me. <laughs> well, I was thankful to God that they brought it to me because they didn't know. But just through the, the, the dynamic of seeing this, the opportunities are, the only thing that will limit this is if we limit this ourselves. Kathleen Lawrence is the uh, chairman of the board of the Minnesota Council on Black Minnesotans and has kind of a bird's eye view of the demographics of the black community in Minnesota. Patwin, what's the story from the point of view of the Council on Black Minnesotans? Uh, describe black Minnesota. All right. Well, thanks for having me, um, Al. Uh, I'm excited to be here. This is a fantastic topic. Um, so last year, the Council on Black Minnesotans, we did a legacy listening tour where we went out to uh, five different cities, Minneapolis, uh, uh, Faribault, Rochester, Duluth, St. Cloud, and we met with uh, community members. We uh, 
contracted the services of Marnita's Table. And so for those of you not familiar with that model, they use a World Cafe model where they get people together around food to discuss issues, to kind of break down barriers, and then to see how can we move a community forward. And we found a lot of very interesting things. And one of the things we did find out that there was some um, tension between the African and African American communities. And it comes out of a lot of what the panelists have already said. Um, you know, a lot of uh, suspicion and mistrust and not communicating and not learning about each other. And so we decided um, as a council learning about the various groups, like for instance in southern Minnesota, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, South Sudanese that are down there and also Somalians, a lot of people working in the meat packing uh, industry. Uh, that's why a lot of African immigrants came here uh, to the state of Minnesota because of that and also the good social services that are here. And uh, We're lucky to be in a state like Minnesota where they were really on the cutting edge after I believe it was 1940 with the uh, Displaced Persons Act. Um, they were really on the forefront of uh, welcoming immigrants to the state. However, integrating them into the state has been another story. And so from the Council on Black Minnesotans perspective, we're a state council that serves not only African American community, but the African community as well. And so we've increased the numbers of African uh, members on our board. Um, we have three now that are on our board. In our legislation, we are only mandated to have two, one west, one east. Um, then that's one of the things that I talked to the governor's office about increasing that and have true diversity. Um, because we want to hear and have our um, eyes and ears in the community so that we can know how do we advocate effectively for, those, for these communities. And um, out of the listening tour, that came our legislative agenda that we had earlier this year. And also, um, we're doing a cultural relations summit, which is coming up the last week in uh, June, June 28th, 29th, and 30th, where we're looking at bringing the African and African American communities together to talk, to dialogue. Uh, we're doing DNA testing for the African American community members. Uh, I'm an amateur geneolo genealogist. I've done the DNA tracing, and it's so interesting. Tell me about it. What'd you find? Yeah. So, well, my maternal line goes back to Nigeria, Igbo, and then I'm part of uh, about third of African American males, our uh, Y DNA, our, our paternal line does not go back to Africa, it goes back to Europe for a number of different reasons. Um, but indirectly it goes back to the uh, Mandinka tribe. Um, so uh, in knowing that and knowing my history, then I can go back and look at those uh, places in Africa and learn about the culture that we were denied um, coming over on the Middle Passage. And one of the things that we're gonna be discussing at the conference in the very beginning is looking at the roots. See, we like to talk about disparities and the different issues that are going on in the community. And I think, not that that's a waste of time, but that's not what needs to be done. What needs to be done is to talk about the causes. And the causes in, in the African American community is the uh, Middle Passage. When we lost our language, we lost our heritage, we lost our names, we lost who we are, and we had to adopt someone else's culture, someone else's religion. Uh, for instance, um, you know, a lot of times you hear, especially from Muslims, like for instance with the Nation of Islam, Christianity is a white man's religion. Well, that's not true because early Christianity was mainly founded in Northern Africa, out of Alexandria and Carthage, and you had Cyprian and, and St. Augustine. And um, you have the uh, Coptic Orthodox Church, and you have the uh, Ethiopian Orthodox Church. And a lot of Christians just in general don't know about that, but even black Americans, African Americans, don't know that history that's there. Um, also, um, the, the Jewish faith. Um, you know, people just see the people you see in Israel, and I'm here to tell you a lot of people who are, you know, are part of the original Jews were black people that look like us. Um, you know, they're in Ethiopia, for instance. And so we're gonna be bringing a lot of that out. And then of course, Islam. Islam has a, a huge impact on Africa as well. And so we're gonna be covering that because we need to get back to learning about who we are. That's gonna be the key to our success. The key to getting rid of these disparities is learning who we are, changing that mindset. Uh, for instance, as Reverend McAfee said, people would trust them with uh, trust him with their spiritual um, house, but their things that are temporal, they're, they're okay. And you know, that, that shows the mindset that we have when we get into issues of hair and color. You know, that all comes out of the middle passage and things that were taken from us. And in, in terms of Africa, the scramble for Africa and the colonialism, you know, that had a huge impact on Africans. And so we need to get to those root issues, um, talk about those, and then work through those so that then we can truly come together as a community, and that's what the council is seeking to do. That's great. So Reverend McAfee, wouldn't it be great to have uh, all of the uh, churches uh, participate in the strategy so that people that wanted to could do the DNA 
uh, sampling so that we would maybe have, uh, you're going to be doing about 50 to start with, right? But wouldn't it be great to have 3,000 or 5,000 through the, uh, the, the Baptist Convention or through some collaboration where we try to map the genealogy of 10,000 black folks in Minnesota? and find out what our connections are to the Caribbean, to South America, to Africa, to Europe, or wherever we may be connected to. Uh, what would that feel like? I think it would be awesome. I think one of the easy things that we can do, because we have all of our churches on uh, line as well, that we can get the information out to. And it's so the information is so critical for identity. If you look at what happens in our community, every gang, every set, every nation, it's about identity. And if you, don't, if, if, if you allow others to define your reality, then you'll live up under their definition. And as he so uh, eloquently pointed out, most folk who, who don't have a clue about Christianity, they think it started in America and it actually didn't. And just that type of information, I, I didn't change my last name. My last name is McAfee. Now you can look at my skin color and you know I'm not Irish. <laughs> but the history of my family, uh, my grandfather, and my great-grandfather were not slaves. And so they process differently. They taught us differently. I was taught from this high Jesus was a black man. Identity being developed and connected with my family. And if we start giving that to our kids, because you're something without having stuff. And that's where we're lost at. And so if, you, we, if we start instilling in them that history, where they come from, that the blood that beat through your veins was not the weakest of the slaves that died in the Middle Passage, it's from the strongest. And so if we would just look at what has been designed to mentally destroy us, and if the council now is saying, listen, we want to come and try to give you all some proper information about yourself, then maybe you'll stop uh, calling each other B's and N's and all this other kind of stuff, and you'll really know who you are. And we get that piece done. I think this, again, just expands the capacity for everything we're trying to do. Let's open this for questions from our audience. Uh, if you have a question, please come to the microphone and uh, say your name and make your statement or raise a question. And I encourage everyone here who's uh, interested in making a comment, please make it. And I thank you all for being here. Al Flowers, thank you for being here. Uh, I, I just want to say I, I think it's a great show. And, and as we uh, working on economic issues, I want to, uh, uh, with uh, the Somali community, th this is the right time to have this discussion and this conversation because uh, economically, I think it's going to be a boom of, of work for uh, people of color in 2020. We'll be 27% of the population in 2040. Well, minorities will be almost half of the working force. And so I, I'd mind is more of a comment to say uh, that this is the right time and, uh, and thank people like Louis King, who's working with uh, Abzak Behe, and thanking uh, Jackie Cherry Home, who's uh, working with Louis King to make sure that we get some of this construction, this big construction boom coming to Minneapolis, coming to the north, a lot coming on the north side but with the hub and all these things going to be built that we be a part of it. And I'd like to know how, how do we make sure as leaders that we are really a part of it this time because we've seen it before. And how do we, you know, uh, Jackie is running for, for mayor. How do, how do we make sure this time that we don't get more reports and we are going to be a part of this economic boom that's coming to our city? The question, you know, when you talked to uh, Al Flowers, it reminded me of the story I heard from Saeed Fahia, who was the uh, president of the Confederation of Somalis in Minnesota. I met with uh, Saeed and some elders, and they told me the story about the movement of Somali refugees from Somalia into, uh, I think, Kenya. And when they first started coming in large numbers, the Kenyan economy was organized in a way that Kenyans were at the bottom of the totem pole and that there were other people that were not Kenyans who controlled the entire retail and commercial and banking sector. And there was a system that consistently uh, and effectively kept Kenyans out of control and out of power in their own 
country read community here. And so what the Somalis did was say, you know what, uh, this guy is selling you know, the neighborhood ABC product. We're gonna go buy it from the same place he's buying it from and set up shop next door to him and sell it for less. Not only will we do that, we're gonna hire people from the Kenya community to learn the business and to grow the business. And in time, they were able to displace the entire set of foreign businesses that were there down pressing, keeping out, excluding the Kenyans from entrepreneurial activity. So I said, that's a model. That's an idea, because we always are concerned about some of the neighborhood stores that come in and take money out and treat our people yeah. like we are a problem. Mm -hmm. And that's something we've always talked about. So we need to figure out a model of cooperation where there's this energy for entrepreneurship, energy for business, but also a chance to create partnerships where we work together. What do you think, uh, Abdi? Um, that's really a very good point, and um, I, along this relationship, um, we have benefited a lot so far. Um, before I go answer that question, I want to tell a story sure. that I always tell about the construction and, and skills. In my neighborhood where I lived for the past 16 years in the high rises and I've raised family, um, predominantly East African, Ethiopian and Somali, um, we, the, the owners of those buildings, applied for a grant of a couple hundred million dollars um, to rehabilitate the buildings, basically to make our lives better. That's what the grant was about. So we sold, we were sold to the idea, and we have organized ourselves, boarded into buses, went into city council, testified that $250 million should be given to this owner to rehabilitate the high rises. Before we did that, we put some agreements into the MOU that 90 of us will be employed in the construction as an apprentice to learn skills because we don't have skills. So I was one of the people who really sit on the city council chair that day. It felt nice. Um, yeah. um, to say this should happen, and I was interpreting for people. It did happen, $250 million from the union, AFL-CIO, New York, from Google, from the city of Minneapolis, all those free money came in. The work started, and we fought for the jobs, and all we get was bellboy at the elevator. I mean, we don't live in Hilton, so I don't know why we needed someone to work <laughs> in the elevator. <laughs> and um, also some other jobs. Then we had to fight for that. And um, then we said, where are the construction jobs? Then they said, who does have uh, experience or skills? Then we started to fight for skills. I'm glad um, Al Flowers took me to meet um, a wonderful leader, um, Louis King at the Summit Academy. He gave me a tour. I couldn't believe what I saw. I saw all the skills we needed were right there. And as of right now, I'm working to engage East African community to go to Summit Academy for four months and learn construction jobs. We were all taken to the, even to the stadium to participate and be a part of the construction that's happening right in our neighborhood. It's amazing when you have a dialogue and working with your brothers and sisters and neighbors. When you talk to people, you gain, you don't lose. So now we are gaining something we have never gained. Now we are able to work and get skills right here in our neighborhood. Now we, are, we will be able to work on Cedar Avenue when there's a construction. Coming back to the business question, um, I told Louis King, one day he asked me, what do you want? What's your interest? Um, a bunch of us, Somali uh, American leaders and um, African American leaders. And one of the things that came to my mind was that why shouldn't we have, we have African mall in Cedar Riverside. But all you see there is not really African. It's a Somali and Oromo and Ethiopian, that's it. People there owning those shops. 85% of owners are women. So I said, why shouldn't we have a real African market in North Minneapolis? That itself is, is a daily school. When you meet, when you're shopping 
and we talk a lot. We are very informal culture, Africans. So we exchange, we're not only buying and empowering each other financially, but we are learning from each other culture. So that's my dream, and I'm very much hopeful that it's gonna happen. One of the things that we were able to do, and matter of fact, Jackie was instrumental uh, in helping with the district headquarters uh, with Mortensen Construction and getting it, and contrary to what was printed in certain papers, Mortensen did a remarkable job with African American participation. Their numbers, they exceeded every goal that was set. Now some folk lied, and they lied, hear me, they lied. But Martinson done a great job. Now, let, let me be clear. We first got involved with Martinson with the Target Stadium. The numbers were not right, nor were they good. When Lewis tried to get some meetings with them, he was shut down. I called Richard Copeland, who was there at the time. I said, Richard, just giving you a heads up. We're going to go chain ourselves to the fence tomorrow, so ain't nobody going to be working. He said, well, what are you talking about? Well, Y'all ain't hiring no black folk, and you ain't gonna work this close to North Minneapolis, and black folk ain't gonna get hired. He get a meeting set up right upstairs at the Urban League, and Mortensen done something that just blew me away. I was prepared with all of my verbal, linguistical uh, abilities and artillery that I, yeah, to, to light them up. And John Woods, and I, and blew me away. He said, Reverend, you all are right. We're sorry. I'm blown away because in the history of trying to work, fight for us, ain't nobody ever come out and admitted we were right from the beginning. He said, give us the chance and we'll get this thing right. Martinson put pressure on every sub. All of those numbers at the Target Stadium even went up. And so we have to utilize the same type of, of, of mechanism, Al, to make sure that African Americans participate on this stadium, also on that bridge. And when I say Af African people, people of color, period, that we participate, what the governor has done, and Kevin Lindsay with those goals at 32% was rem off the chain. And we have to watchdog it. And whatever's not right, I believe we got enough people in places uh, who are sensitive to those things that we make sure we get it right. Let me just Jackie? That, that, you know, um, as the professor said earlier, lots of misunderstandings ar arise when there's perceived to be a scarcity of resources. And people get to fighting over a little bit of nothing is what it amounts to. Mm -hmm. And life is difficult enough, and there are enough forces out there that are not moving in folks' favor mm -hmm. that we have a responsibility to be together as a group to ensure we all get part of that because it, there's enough stuff going on to keep people out that we all need to be working together. And I think uh, uh, Reverend McAfee brings up a very good point about the construction opportunities that are, that are there now. I mean, it's not just the stadium. It's the new Southwest light rail that's gonna happen, that is, that is really going to happen. It's the Target Center renovation. Mm -hmm. It's all the buildings that are going up downtown. I mean, there have to, we have to find ways to make those opportunities real for people, and it will come when, as a community, folks are unified and speaking with one voice and working together, because enough folks just wanna kind of pit people against each other and fight about a little bit of this and a little bit of that. There's a, if, if the group is unified. If a, a group comes forward that includes uh, Behe and Reverend McAfee and Fla Mr. Flowers and Lewis King, how do you argue with that group? Good point. Yes, sir. Hello, my name is Omar, and I'm a Northside resident for pretty much for all my life. Um, there's been a lot of talk about the construction trades, and first of all, I just wanted to thank the panel for spending taking time out of their day and 
coming together on this topic, but um, there's been a lot of talk about construction trades. I'm a member of the North Central Regional uh, Carpenters Union uh, in St. Paul, and um, one of the things and one of the disparities is that there's not a lot of information about how to become a member of the union and how to become involved so we can actually be a part of these programs. We hear a lot about uh, Summit Academy and whatnot and different, but could you, could you please talk about some of the avenues that and some of the things that are being done to uh, create opportunities so the knowledge can get to the masses because we have a disparity in North, or in North Minneapolis and we don't need to talk about it, but how can we get the information to people a little bit more effectively? Let me respond to that. You know, so I own a newspaper, Insight News, and I view Insight as the voice of our community uh, in North Side, South Side, uh, and St. Paul. One of the things that Insight needs to do, but it needs you to make it happen, is to make a demand of business and government and institutional uh, players who have these opportunities. They need to make those opportunities known to our people in media that we choose, that we say represent us. That means Insight News, it means a spokesman recorder, it means KMOJ, KFAI. But our community has to go to uh, the mayor's office, to the governor's office, uh, to the county commission and say all of the contracts for bids or the bid notices, we want to see them every week in Insight News hear about them on KMOJ. And so we have to say and demand that if we don't do it, don't demand it, it won't happen. We all then remain unaware, not knowing, and to the degree that we can make that demand and get more information, as paid information in our media, it gives the media more opportunity to do more feature stories and more collaboration on quality of life issues in our community. So that's my response to that. Last question, yes sir. Um, my name is Saluki. I had a question for when is the DNA test going to be done and where and how and is there a price and how much is it going to be? Well, uh, <laughs> well, actually it's going to be coming out later this week. Um, our invitations are going to start going out for the event, which is uh, at the end of June. Um, we have pretty quick turnaround time. What we're going to do, is we're testing through African Ancestry. Um, which are the pioneers of DNA testing for uh, African Americans. And um, when the invite goes out, it's going to be for the first 50 that, um, that register. And how do you and, register? And, and so when you get the invite, there'll be a link in there that you'll go, you'll input your information, and then we will send that to African Ancestry. So do, do we give you the information? Yes, if you're interested, yes, give me, yes, exactly. I'm yes. And, uh, uh, Yes. With that as well, and, and, and oh yes, one of the things that I think that could even further it along, that if you did it congregationally, because here's what I know about African American congregations: if you catch them on Sunday, you can mm -hmm. clean them on Sunday. Oh yeah. Yes. But many times, if you tell them to come back another day, they might may not do it, mm -hmm. and that might be a way of of expanding it. And if there's a cost to it, some of those mm -hmm. churches might be willing to help do some mm -hmm. things because. I think it's just that critical. It's a great idea. Yeah, and there's no cost. Oh, there's as no well cost. As, yeah, as well as the conference. No, there's no, no cost, cost for the 50 that you're going to do, but there is a yeah. cost for the service. You've got a promotional deal with yes. them to do yeah. these 50. But Reverend McAfee, it might be a good idea for the churches to get around this and understand that there is a business piece under this and figure out how we do this business yeah. so that uh, when we get this work done. Uh, Daniel, last words. What are your thoughts? Would you uh, reflect on our community and where we need to go to build community? What do we need to do? You know, one of the things I start to imagine as we talk about the various challenges that we had, but also the opportunities that present itself, is that I, I just start imagining if the African American community and the African community come together and build a coalition to go beyond the asking to making a decision. City council, uh, governors, you know, I mean, the entire political system should be open for these communities. So I, I really honestly think that the coalition is such a powerful way that we can be able to establish some kind of strength, build a voice, uh, that we can start making decisions about our destiny. So we're down to final comments. Jackie Cherry Holmes, thank you for being here. How do you see uh, reaching out and connecting uh, immigrant and traditional communities as part of uh, strengthening uh, our community? I think it is exciting and I think it's our responsibility 
not just as, as elected leaders or potential elected leaders, but as citizens. We have a responsibility. We, we can be an even more vibrant community and more vibrant city, and that will happen when we reach out and know each other and engage with each other in real and authentic ways. As I said earlier, not just about, you know, um, I need you to do this for me or I'm gonna stop by your restaurant today and then tell, tweet out to everybody how, how cool it was that I was here. It's about having relationships. It's about being neighbors and being in community with each other. And that's our responsibility. And it's, a, 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 it's an awesome responsibility, but it's a very, very, very exciting time for our city. Abdi, final word. What, do you, what final word from you? Uh, what's your expectation? What do you want to happen in our community to My move the ball is, forward? Um, along with all of us, is that we have the best opportunity to work together, to learn from each other, and it starts on May 25th at the New Salem Baptist Church. We are all invited to get together. We're gonna have um, Ethiopian music, Somali music, African American music. We're gonna dance, we're gonna talk to each other, we're gonna eat together, and that's a big start. It's not that we just, we'll start on 25th. We have started about six years ago, working with the same leaders, with Al Flowers and Spike Moss, and many others. I will, I will also um, wanna congratulate that for a long time I've been organizing my community. Uh, I'm one of the organizers. Um, I wanna congratulate the young leaders in our community that turn out thousands and thousands of people to vote for Mr. Abdi Warsame, mm -hmm. who won the um, endorsement of the DFL leadership, and we are expecting him mm -hmm. to be at the event on the 20th, May 25th, he already promised it. And um, we want to also work all of us together, and other leaders that endorse it in their other words. And uh, we wanna also work with you. Um, the last time the city had a a woman mayor was Sales Belton, and we did work with her. Relations were much better, so we're expecting the same thing. Thank you. Uh, Pat Wynn Lawrence, uh, 30 seconds. Well, I think uh, the African and African American communities, they can learn a lot from each other. Um, the African American community from the African community can learn about their history back in Africa. That it doesn't, our history doesn't start back in uh, 1621, but it goes further back for thousands of years. Um, that we can also learn uh, more entrepreneurial skills. We love how the immigrants, when they come here, how they set up businesses. Um, we in the African American community, community need to start setting up our own banks, and I love how we were discussing things like that, our own business. Um, and then we maybe we need to develop partnerships like you know maybe our churches and mosques and synagogues can have relationships together you know our businesses an African business and an African American business can form a partnership together and then we can do something for our schools in terms of education we can create like the Jews have the yeshivas and the um, uh, Muslims have um, I believe it's uh, the madrasas. We can create our own where we can do our own cultural and institutional learning and education amongst our people to help us advance. Final word, uh, Reverend McAfee, thank you for co-hosting and organizing this. Thank you for what you're doing in the community uh, all the time. But uh, let's wrap this up. Well, thank, thank you. Uh, let, and the last thing I would say is this, and I would say this to my brother at the council, whenever we're doing something, we never just like to do it in isolation. We like to work with people. And I believe that what we're trying to do on the 25th, if it's not too soon, we'd love to have the council to be a part of that uh, so we can expand. It's not about one person. It's about pulling us all together for the collective cause of building up our people. Because I believe when we lift ourselves up, then our white brothers and sisters will be lifted up just as well too. Because you all know our genes are not recessive. They came from us. We didn't come from them. And so with that, we can make this community and this state much better. Thank you so much. I thank my entire panel. I thank you in the audience. And thank you who are listening and watching. I'm Al McFarland. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We got to say good night. We want to thank Al McFarland for bringing us all those great words and all our lovely guests. All the guests in the house, everything's good, you know. So I want y'all to tune in every Tuesday morning, right around 9 o'clock. Because we're going to play a song. All the guests will be home. We'll be feeling like talking. Have a robust
conversation. Cause this thing is safe. The message is clear. Everybody knows we gotta give it life clear. <laughs> 